Good morning. Good morning. I am Dr. Jeff Murdoch, the director of the Arkansas Center for Black Music and director of choral activities here at the University of Arkansas. It is my pleasure to invite you to our first lecture of our lecture series of the Arkansas Black Music Symposium. Our first lecturer is uh, an amazing mezzo-soprano, and we are so uh, delighted to have her here. She will be in recital this evening, but this morning she will be speaking on a topic that is near and dear to her heart. Dr. Alexis Davis Hazel is an assistant professor of music, uh, voice, and lyric diction at the University of Alabama, uh, being at an STC school here uh, where, where Razorbacks uh, reigns Supreme, we will forgive her for being from uh, Crimson Tide land, but we welcome her uh, uh, with open arms here to the University of Arkansas. Um, you can read more about her bio on our Black Music Symposium website, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first lecturer, Dr. Alexis Davis Hazel. Good morning and thank you. Thank you for joining me this fine morning. Um, thank you for choosing this place to be and among the many places you could have been at this hour. Um, I wanna take just a little bit of your time to briefly discuss the lives and the work and somewhat the rediscovery of these two remarkable women who deserve much more frequent mention in our conversation and in our curriculum. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Jeffrey Murdoch for that uh, lovely introduction and for the invitation to participate in this symposium. This is such a fantastic mission and uh, I'm happy to be part of the events for the University of Arkansas Center for Black Music. So go with me on a journey here for a little while. Um, as, as the history of our nation has forced the lens of, of a cultural binary perspective on all of us to some degree, black artists that are bringing in Western art music into our musical education and into our cultural experience, along with uh, those of our heritage, are constantly contending with the polarizing and pendulum swinging of the gravitational pull to either exploit or to minimize our own cultures. And in our present day conversations, I believe that as we unearth these unforgotten contributions, these forgotten contributions, and support new work from diverse places, we're striving toward balance and more inclusive, wider range of accepted sounds associated with black peoples. Uh, notice I say peoples. The musical function and expression in black cultures because, and I say that, that because the plurality of our perspectives could not and should not be minimized. That itself is a whole entire conversation and which I bring up uh, to introduce these people to you uh, if you don't already know them. These are two people who sought and received incredible training. They strove, they each strove to find their individual voices among the fray of cultural and societal tensions. Each results in an eclectic style that ranks highly when you rate it among 20th century American neoclassical composer voices. And they did all this in spite of the obstacles of racism, sexism, and even financial and health issues. Julia Perry and Irene Britton Smith were in their time pulled in the direction that seems to minimize their connections with black culture, but only on a surface reading. They sought to master the forms they were taught, give them unique voicing, and they wished to be thought of and heard of first as composers before their societal identity. So do we know who they are? If we don't, why don't we know who they are? How many in this room have heard of these composers? Yes, thank you. And, and where did you learn about them? Did you learn about them in school, in your curriculum? African American Art Song Alliance. African American Art Song Alliance. Where else did you learn about them? 
by, by way of studying the repertoire? Yes. So you, were you assigned that repertoire or did you seek it out? Both. Both. Wonderful. So I've, I've not yet heard anyone say they've heard about these peace people in curriculum, right? So why don't more of us know who these women are? I'm going to attempt to answer that. It's not the most obvious question, the most obvious answer. So if you'll permit me a diversion for a moment here, um, I want to talk about the concept of elegance. And the concept of elegance in Eurocentric Western art music criticism is frequently defined by restraint, clarity, perceptions of correctness, propriety, and purity. I'd like you to take a moment to ponder how these ideas and beliefs are realized and how they are prescribed within the classical music aesthetic and in its business as well as in our larger society. Each one of these words are loaded with connotations. Sit with it for a minute. Think about who specifically defines these rules of etiquette and assessment. How do we interact with the dynamics around these ideals, these rules, as black artists, as black people? How have we been reacted to in terms of these, these kind of ideals? I found this to be an interesting place um, to center my, my thoughts or my discussion, uh, particularly when examining the various ways that black artists work to defy the pigeonholing and stereotyping that we experience in, black, in classical music and beyond classical music. Um, so um, I hope you'll be willing to share at the end what comes up for you as a result of this discussion. So one of the more exciting clips that I'd like to share with you this morning comes uh, courtesy of the Apex Contemporary Performance Presenting Organization. And they've done us a great service by broadcasting uh, this interview and an introspective on Julia Perry. So we'll start with Julia Perry. In December of last year, they mounted uh, a project to film and, and broadcast this work and included a um, an English translation of Julia Perry's work for Contralto, the Stabat Mater, which was originally set to Latin text. Um, so I'm excited about this clip because you're going to get to hear Julia Perry introduce herself. I'm going to let Julia Perry introduce herself by playing a clip from a 1954 post-concert Q&A session at Columbia University. She, they performed Stabat Mater, one of the pieces we'll be talking about and sharing the recording of today, um, in 1954, along with a piece by George Antile, the famous experimental American composer. This is a clip from the post-concert talk, and Julia Perry is going to introduce herself, and the, the first voice you're going to hear is the moderator, Aaron Copeland. So here we go. Let's hear what Julia Perry has to say. Um, Ms. Perry, since you're right next to me, perhaps you'd like to, or perhaps you'd be kind enough to, uh, tell us where you come from and something about your studies and maybe where you're heading for. Oh, well. <laughs> well, I can tell you from where I come and something about my studies, but where I'm heading, I don't know. <laughs> uh, my home is Akron, Ohio, and I went to Westminster Choir College in 1947, or rather graduated in 1947, and received a master's degree in 1948. Uh, in 1950, I went to Juilliard and studied orchestral conducting. 51, the summer of 51, I received a scholarship to Tanglewood and studied with Luigi Dalla Piccola. From there, I went to Florence and stayed nearly two years, returning last August. It's about <laughs> uh, Are you really going to be that modest about uh, what your ideals are for the future, what you hope to do? Are you planning to teach? 
Well, if I can get around it, no. <laughs> I, I want to return to Europe, if I can, in, uh, to Florence, and continue with Dalla Piccola for a while longer. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you write while you were working with Mr. Dalla Piccola? Well, I wrote a piece for orchestra. I call it a piece for orchestra. I could call it an uh, episode or uh, green on green or something, but I just chose it. <laughs> and uh, a work based on letters of St. Catherine of Siena for solo voice, chorus, and chamber orchestra, and a one-act opera by one of our American writers, Edgar Allan Poe. And at present, I'm working on a string quartet. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So that, I, what a gem um, to be able to hear her own voice and, and hear her speak. Um, so I'll use this as my segue to give you a little more information about her background. She was raised in a very musical family. She's from Akron, Ohio. Um, she is the fourth of five sisters, and they all had the opportunity to study voice and piano, among other instruments. She studied composition even as a youth, which I find remarkable. Uh, her father, uh, this music was important to her father. Her father was a physician uh, and an avocational pianist who actually had the opportunity to play for Roland Hayes early in his, uh, in his piano playing career. Um, so, you, heard, uh, oh, sorry. you got a good overview. Technology, I moved my mouse over to the wrong place. That won't be the first time that happens. So, <laughs> you heard her say briefly, in the early 50s she was training at Juilliard and spent her summers uh, as a Tanglewood Fellow, uh, student of, of Dalla Piccola. Um, that the first major composition that I'm gonna scrub through and play a little bit for of you for you it was called Stabat Mater uh, was uh, performed in 1951 and then in 1952 and 1954 respectively she won Guggenheim fellowships to study um, in Italy in Siena and then uh, in in 54 she went back to study with Nadia Boulanger um, immediately after coming back her Opera, The Cask of Amontillado, was first staged in Colum at Columbia University. Um, I'm going to scrub through here and just give you a small preview of the Apex performance. Just so you can hear a little bit of it. pause it there because I have more music to share with you so just a little teaser there so see there we go <laughs> when I move the thing over too far I'm just trying to touch the all I'm trying to do is t touch my scroll down it keeps on oh. wow okay I'm just going to have to let him play while I, <laughs> while I did my scroll bar on the other screen. Um, <clears throat> so she returned to the U.S. Um, and found that the opportunities were not as plentiful as what she experienced in Europe. So she actually did wind up taking up teaching. 
Um, she served on the music faculty at Florida A&M and later took a teaching position at Atlanta University. Um, she did focus on vocal works early on in her career, but then turned to more instrumental compositions. Um, she has a catalog of, a small catalog of art songs, some sacred songs, particularly um, choral pieces with uh, solo voice. There are cantatas and a few spirituals arrangements. Um, you may have seen a few of them in the Hildegard publication of, of African American women composers. Um, she completed three operas, 12 symphonies, two piano concertos. Only 13 of these total works are in print and accessible today. It becomes uh, difficult, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about why things are difficult when it comes to uh, publishing with Julia Perry. So uh, less than a handful of all these works that I've mentioned are for The Voice. Now let's see if it's gonna... Just wanna share a quote give you a moment to read it. Before I go on. I would say that Julia Perry's contribution to American art music is the invention of her eclectic style. She took a synthesis of black American musical experiences with the European tradition and she exhibited a 20th century neoclassicist sensibility. She was very prolific, as you heard from the, the uh, genres that she has produced, but she didn't live very long. Uh, she only lived to be 55. And in spite of her incredible training and her career launch being quite auspicious early on, um, the chronic health issues and um, you know societal issues disrupted her career, delayed things, and then after she passed, you know um, there was really very little discussion about her. So what explains that dip in awareness from her death to the present? Even, even Helen Walker Hill's work only brings her to the awareness of some small segments of us, of musicians and scholars. So the, the partial answer lies in the issue with publishing rights. Perry's works are protected until 2049. She died in 1979. Um, so the publishers of her current uh, currently active publications are keeping royalties in escrow while uh, an heir and a manager of her estate uh, was being found. But in the meantime, there's no vehicle to authorize new publications. There were uh, reports in the, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. There were reports in the local um, journal in, in Akron about sort of the mystery that's unfolding about um, Julia Perry's relatives. She did not have children herself, so we're looking at the, the descendants of, of her sisters, and it's discovered that there is a, a remaining sister that was alive um, just in, in recent years, and that she had an attorney that could represent her and potentially represent the estate. Um, however, because Perry didn't probate anything, she didn't probate any property or any of her, um, her catalog of works and she didn't donate it to anyone, um, even though it, it, it is in the hands of certain scholars and has been digitized, there is no mechanism to be able to get permission to publish her work, to publish the things that haven't been published or to republish the things that have gone out of print. Galaxy Music Publishers was the company that 
um, had the majority of her vocal uh, repertoire that she had approved for publish. Um, so now that um, a sister, uh, the daughter of a, her, one of her sisters has been identified to um, possibly be able to help with this process, um, hopefully this is going to be moving forward and we're going to hear more, we're going to see more of Julia Perry. This research has been, um, has been aided by Louise Toppin, um, um, Vic Fleischer, and, um, and James uh, Blakely. So I find it really interesting that there has been this explosion in the last three years of, of her uh, work, both, for both of these women actually. And so three years ago in 2020 or 2019, when you went to go on YouTube to look for Julia Perry, there was very few um, offerings there to look at. And these were two of them. This, um, I'm gonna play just little snippets of her study for orchestra that you heard her talk about with Aaron Copeland that was uh, played by the Philharmonic in the, the New York Phil in um, Lincoln Center in 1965. And also a little bit of the original recording of the Stabat Mater. it there and now jump over to the Stabat Mater another section and let me correct myself this was not the original recording this is a recording that was made in Japan the very first performance of Stabat Mater was actually performed by Julia herself. scrub forward there. So there have been two other performances of this just in the last couple of years. Um, so it's very exciting to see this, this repertoire start to, start to surge and I'm hoping that the more 
we can talk about this and bring these topics up that um, we'll see more of these mounted. I also want to take just a moment to talk about her operas um, and, and her musical language generally. So as you've heard, her musical language is, is very steeped in the mid 20th century. Um, she frequently uses 12 tone materials and um, you can hear the, her use of ostinato and her use of, of three note motives. Um, Quite, fre quite frequently, her vocal textures are declamatory, um, and there are alternating uses of lyricism, depending on the piece. Some pieces have more lyricism than others. What you'll hear me sing on the program tonight will, have, will be more of conventional lyricism and harmony, um, but as she moves later in her compositional periods, she focuses on, um, you know, very, economical resources, not much melisma, um, more dealing with uh, registration shifts and, and um, dynamic contrast. The reviews of uh, the, the first opera that, was, that had been staged, The Cask of Amontillado, were mixed. Uh, they, lent, they did lean towards complementary though, and they praised her for originality and imaginative use of orchestration, pace, and setting of the vocal lines, which she does effectively to, to amplify text and put the power of the voice out front. Um, this piece was performed three times in her lifetime, and there is a recording that is housed at the Columbia University Library. Um, that recording was made in, in, uh, on no November 20th of that year. Um, I'm, I'm aware of um, another scholar that's, that's working independently. And that's, a, that's something that's interesting about Julia Perry, the activity around her right now. There are you know, a, a few organizations like the Apex um, Contemporary Performance, but uh, the Akron Symphony as well, um, you know, holding her up as a, as a, a hometown uh, composer is you know, lifting up her work, um, as well as a few independent scholars that are, and they're not all really talking with one another, so there is a lot of activity um, going around that isn't particularly coordinated. All right, so I'm gonna flow on to talk about Irene Britton-Smith. She's born and raised on the south side of Chicago to music appreciating parents, not quite as um, musically involved as Julia Perry's parents, but they fostered her, 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 com her compositional passion from a young age. She took piano lessons with V. Emanuel Johnson and she began composing even as a youth as well. In her teens, she developed interest in the violin. This is similar to Julia Perry. Um, so violin and piano. Um, she taught herself on her older sister's instrument and then was offered some um, formal study by a, a formal uh, a public school teacher. Oh, I went, I'm gonna back up, hold on. Okay, so she, she really wanted to attend Northern, Northwestern University um, for music, but she, her family couldn't afford to send her. So she intend, instead, she attended the Chicago Normal School and earned her teacher certification and began teaching in the Chicago Public School District. And during the 30s, she played as a violinist in the All Black Harrison Farrell Orchestra. She also got married to, to Mr. Herbert E. Smith. Uh, and now you're going to see sort of the spacing of her education, and I find this is noteworthy to mention because she went directly into teaching. She spent 40 years as a, as a teacher in the Chicago Public Schools, and she worked her summers and every opportunity that she had to, to gain her um, compositional education. She pursued a degree in music theory and composition 
one course per year. And this is after some encouragement that was given to her by Florence Price. She was very, uh, she was very modest about her abilities and was even so shy that uh, she didn't take Florence Price up on her offer to come and visit and, and work with her. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go, this thing is advancing on me. Okay. Um, another thing I, I, that I find to be remarkable about this lady is that she's, she and her husband spent the majority of the 1940s and the 1950s apart because they were pursuing graduate degrees in separate cities. Um, Mr. Smith was an aspiring engineer and he worked for the post office as his day job. Um, so she's working again, you know, towards uh, a grad school and she starts to see her work take off in the 1940s. So she took a sabbatical from teaching in, from 46 to 47 to study with Vittorio Giannini uh, at the Juilliard School. And then the following summer, um, she was with Irving Fine. So after she attended a seminar in Northwest, uh, at Northwestern University in the late 50s, she became an advocate of the phonovisual method of teaching, beginning reading. So this is her primary, you know, her career that she had, you know, been spending the most time on. Um, but she actually had a publication from that work. So Chicago University Press published her book on that topic in 1960, which was entitled Methods and Materials for Teaching Word Perception in Kindergarten through Grade 3. Uh, she retired from teaching in 1978. She had stopped composing by the early 60s, but her works did receive some performance during her lifetime, so she was able to see that, that happen. Um, a great majority of her work has not been published. Again, she was very modest about her ability, and um, in, in some of her writings, does not describe herself on the same level as a Florence Price. Um, she, so she did not promote herself and didn't have anyone to promote her. I'm gonna play a little example, a little bit of an example that will be on the program this evening. This is one song, and this is the only one that's recorded as of now. This is one of the Dream Cycle songs set to text by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, um, published in Lyrics of Lowly Life, his, uh, Dunbar's Lyrics of Lowly Life, published in 1913. This um, embraces a neoclassical style as well. So she favors the more transparent textures and, and linear voice leading in the accompaniment. Um, and there's a lot of play with mode mixture, modal harmonies. She tended also to avoid African-American folk materials uh, in, in the actual compositions. However, she was drawn to write and set poetry. So she chose to express that aspect of her culture through of, of the African-American experience through words. Um, and I would say Julia Perry even uh, leans more in that direction as well. Um, there, are, there is some evidence of um, African-American folk materials in Julia Perry's work, but it is heavily um, tilted towards expression through words. the stuff that didn't happen when I was testing this out is happening now.
incessant rain, flecked in between the twist of night and Consciousness, the shade wrought out by lack of light and made upon my stream. Why fades our dream? And I'll stop it there, come back for the rest this evening. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, but I have more to share, a little bit more to share music-wise. To get a real sweep and a sense of Irene Britton Smith's music, you need to hear her piano music, you need to hear her violin sonata, and I would love to bring up um, the recording that I would like to play for you of the violin sonata, is uh, the one movement anyway, is not the best quality, but I wanted to, um, I really enjoy this performance, so I wanted you to see that in particular. But I do need to note that one of your faculty here at the University of Arkansas, Erjean Kang, has done a lot of work to, um, to lift up this repertoire uh, and to forward. Really, Irene Britton Smith has gained traction among people in the strings, right? They, they're the ones who know who she is. Um, we don't have as much vocal work, so we're not um, she's not as much in our conversation, but this is why I've, I've brought this topic today. Um, let me start with the Pasacaglia, though. So this, this as Pasacaglias do, this builds from just threads of nothing, patiently, 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 into a huge, huge climax, then dies out and begins to build again. And I'm gonna to start towards the end here, just so you can get a sense of her. So you can hear that her musical language has some similarities with the French neoclassical styles. She, she uses transparent textures, the way she works with linear writing, the, the elegant simplicity, um, the, the callback to the classical era. Um, this can also be heard in the violin sonata that I'll play next. Irene Britton Smith's 
favorite composers were Tchaikovsky and Brahms, and she was also fond of um, composers such as Faure and Frank. Um, you know, there, there's a really small number of these works that have been um, recorded and, and are available um, for online viewing in particular. Um, towards the end of her life, Irene Britton Smith had some difficulty recognizing her own music due to a battle with Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. And she died at the age of 91 due to complications from these diseases. Um, but Irene Britton Smith did um, bequeath her papers and music scores to the Center for Black Music Research at Columbia College of Chicago. So they do constitute the Irene Britton Smith collection and a guide to that collection is easily searchable online. But as I mentioned before, a majority of her existing works have not been published. I encourage you to go and search these out and listen. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes. Okay, and if these things would stop, thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna be ready for some questions and some, some discussion here in a moment. I just wanna leave you with this, um, this final thought. So yes, there are um, some difficult reasons, some accessibility issues uh, that we deal with in attempting to uh, bring out and to, to teach and to perform repertoire from fantastic composers such as these. But anything worth doing takes a little work. And um, if there is a demand, um, we know this, you know, from working with the publishing world, that if there is a demand for something, um, if there is a market for something, that um, we tend to get some results there. So if we can have, we can have access to the work, if we can have permission to, um, to perform or to publish the work, and that we have a demand for people who will, who want to share this music, um, we can make progress here. So um, thank you for, being with me this morning. And um, I'd like to open it up for some comments or, or some questions. Thank you. Yes. Well, it just, I, I like to research, so it, 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 but it took some digging, right? And there's more, I mean, there's plenty more that I, you know, can't share in the time constraints that I have, right? But um, it is not as easy as what 
we're used to right now. We're not used to having to take a trip to a, another city and make an appointment at the library uh, and have them pull archive boxes out. We're not, a, you know, this is a thing that researchers do. Um, we're used to being able to click on a link and buy a book and, you know, having it be done. So it, it does take a bit of work, but it's absolutely worth it. W tell me what else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, there's a lot of us out here. <laughs> there's a lot of us out here who are trying to do this, and you have to talk to people. This is, I think that's probably the, the biggest piece of encouragement I can give you, is get to know folks and talk to them. Um, you know, especially when it comes to trying to get your hands on scores, because there are some folks out here that have things that are out of print, and the only way you're going to get them is by talking. Uh, So we have a few things available. Um, Irene, Brith's, Irene Britton Smith's piano pieces are available um, through J.W. Pepper. Um, um, the, the, the violin sonata is available. Um, but when it comes to these, these pieces that I'm going to perform on the concert tonight, um, these were manuscripts. So um, as I showed you earlier, we have two of them that have been published by um, Videmus. So two out of those four Dream Cycle pieces are in an anthology um, uh, that connected to the African Diaspora Project, but they did not publish the whole, the whole group. Um, so it just, yes, it just takes, it just takes digging. Wonderful. And so we are excited about that, and I just wanted to let you know that her music is still alive and well here. That's wonderful. That that warms my heart truly, because I think I mean, don't you think it's worthy? Yes, it is. You know, yes. Yes, yes, yes. That, uh, that, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I, I come back with a question to say, when you heard the violin sonata, did you hear black music? You just heard music. So, so there's two ways to, to, to bat that back and forth. The answer is no, and the answer is yes. Right? <laughs> the answer is no and the answer is yes. Because why? Because you need to be able to broaden what you expect. You need to be able to broaden your concept of the acceptable sounds that come <laughs> from someone who looks like me, who someone who looks like you. But also, it, this goes back to the sort of the background that I gave you at the beginning of the discussion, which was <laughs> we're we are constantly negotiating that swing back and forth, that gravitational pull. Are you are you to exploit or are you to minimize your um, your heritage? And those of us, you know, who've come up through and who've you know, seeing our, our predecessors come up through, know that there was a very distinct choice that you had to make. Um, either you were choosing to eschew or you were choosing to, to exploit. And there was no balance, there was no middle ground, there was not even um, uh, reverence or true respect or celebration for the heritage um, in, in many cases. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Right. I mean, I'd love to speak to that a little bit, too, because, I mean, that, that goes into, the you know, coming up in the spirituals conversation, too. Um, that, well, for one thing, the easy, the easy answer, which is not easy, but the easy answer to those things are you need to go with the intent of the composer. All right. And regardless of what your heritage is or your background is, you need to go with that. Right. Which means if there are language sounds that you don't understand or that you haven't heard that you need to find out. <laughs> you need to study with someone who can teach you how those how those sounds occur, just as if you were studying German or French or any other language or dialect. Lang duck, lang die, whatever, right? <clears throat> so, so, but, but we do all of those things, right? We are not limited to one thing. We are not a monolith. Yes. 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 <sighs> yes. <sighs> we we if I if I might be on a soapbox a little bit, but I I personally sometimes feel that we um Black folks, sometimes we move on to the next thing. We get excited about something, and then we move on to the next thing. And um, we, we do not fully always appreciate the, the intellectual property and the cultural heritage. <laughs> we don't appreciate that um, because, because we're so accustomed to appropriation. I think that's part of it. Um, we're so accustomed to it, and it is such, it's so ingrained in the American um, entertainment ethos that we don't look at our cultural artifacts as, as that intellectual property. Uh, and I, if we did, I think the support and the, the ability to, to reach out across and get that support, because it's not like there aren't, isn't, aren't resources, right, among the community. And there are resources, um, you know, out there you know, outside of our community, we need to be able to articulate what it is that's important and what the contribution to society is. So like any fundraising effort, you have to be able to articulate what's important so that people will say, yes, I'm going to give to that. I'm going to support that and keep that afloat. That's my soapbox. <laughs> okay. We want to thank Dr. Alexis Davis Hazel for a wonderful presentation. We're going to take a short break before our next lecturer, Dr. Alicia Lola Jones. If you have a moment, uh, most people don't realize uh, classical vocal reprints is a jewel to classical vocalists and instrumentalists alike, particularly those who are interested in African diasporic um, music. And it's based right here in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And Glendower Jones is actually parked. Uh, with, uh, with some of his merchandise and uh, some of his uh, store contents just in the North Lobby. So, uh, hashtag get it from Glendower. If you've been looking for some things, uh, please go check out the, uh, the Classical Vocal Reprints booth just outside in the North Lobby as we get prepared for our next lecturer that begins at 1045.